Hello and welcome to Tomorrow Talk, the podcast that features innovative people to explore cutting edge technologies and ideas that are changing our reality. I am your host, Sabrina Halper, and I'm an investor at Hoff Capital. Please like and subscribe to stay up to date on all things Tomorrow Talk. Today, I will be speaking to Felix Hartman, who is the founder of Hartman Capital, Jonathan Ovadia, who is the founder of X Labs, a leading VR game studio, and Dr. Doom, the founder of Live. They have all been in the space for years, and today I get to talk to them about what a future with virtual reality and augmented reality integrated into our lives is going to look like, Meta's role in the field, we have some hot takes on how Apple will enter the space, and we talk about if you are an investor or founder today wanting to enter the field, how to get started. Hi guys, it is great to, to have you on the show today. I'm very excited to dive into all things VR today. Um, I think to begin, it would be amazing if you guys could each just give a one to two minute, you know, version of when you got into the VR space and what inspired you to be involved in it and, and sort of why you're building on or investing in what you're doing today. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Doom. I don't know why you called me AJ, that's a cardinal sin. We'll deal with oh, that Dr. later. Oh, Dr. Doom. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, don't edit this, this stays. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO at Live. Conceptually, you can think of what we're building as the ability to pull out this device at any time while you're in VR and AR, and take a picture, record a video, or do a live stream um, between yourself, your friends, or your fans. I started in 2016. Um, I lived in a co-op, in a 55-person co-op in San Francisco. Met a guy called Six at the time. He was building VR-ready PCs. And we decided that we would sell these awkward green screen aluminum cubes where we would essentially host or where people would host their own green screen powered shows. Um, and long story short, decided that software is really what we wanted to build. And over the years, we've built a whole suite of camera technologies that help you record your favorite moments with your friends. Hey everyone, thanks for having me. It looks like you missed the note on dressing black. That's all of three of us. So, <laughs> but with that, um, no, my name is Felix Hartman. You know, I've been a futurist my whole life. Um, when I was young, I was building robots. I was studying AI, studying space. Um, so that's always been me. When I was in high school, I realized that one of the best ways to express that passion, the talent is through investing. And so I started, you know, back, back then trading equities, equities and derivatives. I uh, ultimately fell down the crypto rabbit hole, started one of the first crypto hedge funds, um, did well with that, and then ultimately found that I don't just want to only run a crypto hedge fund for the rest of my life, but rather build a frontier tech investment firm. And so our first expansion beyond the world of crypto was the metaverse. You know, of course, I think everybody else here probably hates the term metaverse because it's really there's the XR community and then there's the metaverse, which was like Web3, kind of like bastardized that industry. Um, but at the same time, I really believed that it was the ideal time to start actively in, in, in a significant way investing into the, the VR space because for the longest time, VR was this almost hobbyist community, um, you know, very much vision-driven, passion-driven, but virtually no business models, virtually no total addressable market. And over the recent years, particularly because of, you know, Meta's push and now many other companies are getting in the game, uh, it's become a viable industry. Um, I, we, we believe, and also that it's, it's showing so much growth that we've been, you know, been back in a lot of companies in the VR space, such as Live, such as XLab, amongst many others like, uh, you know, Red Pill, DressX, and so forth. And um, for our, our third men in black, Jonathan. <laughs> Hi, so I'm, I'm Jonathan Ovadia. I'm the founder and CEO of XLab, and we are a virtual reality gaming studio. And I fell into virtual reality by accident. It was 2014. Um, I was a freshman in college. And I ended up helping with my brother um, kind of manage a music label at the time. And one of the artists wanted to explore virtual reality as a medium to create immersive virtual worlds where, you know, you can not only watch a music video, but be inside of the music video. And we worked on that for a few years. And then in 2017, once, uh, you know, some of the first commercial games started coming out, I saw gaming as a crazy use case for virtual reality. We learned a lot from the first virtual reality project we worked on. And in 2017, we decided to go full fledged into development of our game called Veil VR, which is essentially a, you know, a premier virtual reality first person shooter. Um, a lot of people call it, you know, the counter strike of VR, the call of duty of VR. Like this concept of a virtual world and like what VR could offer of a more immersive experience 
it spans, you know, so many things like what it would offer, like education, future of work, military training, therapy, travel. I'm curious, like what are some of those other use cases that are super exciting to you? For me, I think the biggest use case for virtual reality is just is just social in general. Mm. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I used to have to beg my mom, you know, single mother working all day, very hard to leave the work and bring me to friends houses, but I'd beg my mom to bring me to friends houses. Um, nowadays you can jump into virtual reality and connect with people anywhere in the world and just hang out with them. Um, so now we're going to have ideas that are flowing more freely across the world. And, and since you're more connected and you're more present, you feel like you're not just looking at, you know, an avatar anymore. You're looking at a real person that is embodying an avatar and moving the way that a normal person does. So I'm just very excited to see how virtual reality really changes the social dynamics of, of socializing in the world. As a, as a medium. I think there's going to be two camps that are evolving at the same time. One is that social angle, because I think in multiple demographics, whether that's, you know, the young crowd that after school, they can't just like go anywhere. You know, back then it was like, mom, bring me to the mall. Now they're popping on their headset and they're meeting up in the virtual malls. You know, they're in much more fun places than in a mall than from the 2000s kids, you know. And then the <laughs> second demographic is, um, I think there's going to be, I thought about this in recent weeks, there is millennials, like 30 some year olds, right? Where you're hitting a certain age where, you know, your circles are getting small and small and smaller. And in, you can either go out to the bars and like try to meet new people or you pop on a VR headset and you actually can, you know, can meet people um, virtually, which is like low, way, way less friction than like, you know, getting yourself ready and going out. Sounds like people can say like, well, then you're losing touch with physical reality, but we already saw how willing people are meeting people digitally, you know? So I think that that's the social angle. That's the one camp. The other camp I think that's happening at the same time is productivity. So that could be education uh, in, in virtual reality. You know, there's a company where we're looking at um, like Victrix are they already on board with 60 accredited universities teaching, you know, various like accredited courses in VR um, or, you know, immersed VR is like doing the multiple screens that you can work on. Right. So I think on one angle, there's going to be like productivity and then people will, you know, buy a headset to maybe take classes to work and so forth. And that's the gateway drug for them to end up do gaming. Right. Um, like a lot of people bought iPads to work, but then they end up playing Angry Birds on there. Right. So it's a very similar dynamic. And so I think those are the two camps that will, um, both like push forward and you even see already different providers aiming for different crowds like HTC is way more in the enterprise world while you have meta more in the in the gaming world someone might not have bought a Nintendo DS 15 years ago or 10 years ago but they would buy an iPhone and then that leads them to play Candy Crush like you know yep. it's fun and you already have the device um super interesting this is making me think that like VR dating apps are around the corner <laughs> I've always thought about it from a from a mental model perspective of if you think about telepresence and in all the areas in the world where telepresence is not just needed, but definitely used uh, extensively, VR ends up being the ultimate telepresence device. You know, what I've seen of these super cool innovations in VR where you can track eyes and you can track the smallest facial movements and all these things that really start to be able to convey a sense of presence and personality. But what's interesting is that I think to most people that don't work in the space or build in the space, there is a sense that like, we're all going to live in this dystopian world in like a hundred years where we're just living with headsets and we never actually see our friends and nothing's IRL and it's kind of sad, but it sounds that to you guys, it actually really presents the, the opposite opportunity. Yeah, I think a lot of this perspective too, you know, for example, I'm sitting in the room with a lot of friends right now, even though they're not physically in front of me, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we can be in all the different corners of the world and this is already a digital experience. But now instead of having these little squares, we're going to make it very immersive where, you know, we actually like, you know, my, my hands are out of the frame right now, but if this was VR, it's coming with me. Right. Um, every, I think every that's time one I do a VR podcast. I always mess around and run around stage and just do crazy things. And <laughs> people are always like, why are you doing that? I'm like, cause I can't. <laughs> <laughs> but so, yeah. um, to, to, to just add one more thing. I think the dystopia isn't necessarily VR. I think the dystopia is more so VR times AI, when all of a sudden you find yourself in a world where every person you talk to is actually just a generated visual based on the, the you know, all, all the data they've collected on you. And even then you could argue like, hey, if somebody's happy, then what's wrong with that, you know? But, you know, at the same time, I think just creating a digital interface that enables us to more immersively t connect 
there's I think the dystopia is more so a, fa- a factor of people's romanticism to how things have been. There's been this huge AI boom over the past few months, and I think you know it's not not going away. What are some of the use cases you see of some of this like generative AI uh, recent innovation with with virtual worlds or metaverse? Game master creation, world creation, NPC, you know, self generated NPCs, where kind of infinite dialogues, quest generation. I mean, anything. Yeah, I, I was actually just having this conversation with one of our, our you know, main investors yesterday, and it's just going to increase productivity like crazy. Instead of programmers having just to like, you know, program things all day, they just have to feed the right information to, you know, ChatGBT or anything else that comes out. And now you can take 10 programmers bandwidths and replace it with one. If you take a look at gaming as a whole, 70% of investment or, or budget is spent on art assets. Like Call of Duty has thousands of people like farms in other countries because it's not it's not rocket science. It's just manpower, right? That you need to have it's people time building. It's super expensive. It's super time consuming. So they have farms in Russia, Asia, India, you know, just making crates. And I genuinely believe that video game companies that don't adopt like chat GBT or something similar are going to get left behind very quickly. What do you guys feel have been like the biggest limitations or just limiting the the speed and scale at which the the space the VR space grows is it investment is it the motion sickness and like working on that technology or is it just content i i feel like think? it's good con the, the lack of good content that is so compelling that you're actually going to put the screens in front of your face because if if the content doesn't compete with desktop gaming why would somebody go through the trouble of you know putting on a headset and so forth the motion sickness goes away after like seven uses or something like that and so the motion sickness is only a fact of people don't not finding content compelling enough to try it out often where, where it stops happening i think we just haven't had that killer application come out where people say i need vr because of this application, it's more of consumers kind of saying, I don't know what VR is. I hear a lot about it because there's major companies marketing it all day. So they're buying it for curiosity, not for a specific need or action. And once, you know, but you you need you need the ecosystem to have devices so that developers are encouraged to build good enough content. And it's kind of this chicken egg situation, but I think we're very close to getting some of these killer applications, um, you know, that are going to make people just want to buy it because of a specific app instead of so just curiosity. Do you, do you guys feel that we are sort of at this this tipping point where, like, as the hardware is really getting good, we're going to start seeing those killer applications and, like, great developers building more, more on top of these platforms? High level, for me, the biggest problem is that it doesn't have what I call alt-tabbiness. Um, I'm sitting on my PC right now. When I'm done here, I'm going to alt-tab into another application and continue doing my stuff. And when I'm done, mm-hmm. I'm going to alt-tab into a game and play a game. And everything is super integrated. And I'm very used to being able to switch between my experiences, work or otherwise, at the press of a button. And with VR today, as a 33-year-old mega nerd who loves games, if I want to go play games at the end of the day, I still have to get up, put my headset on, start Steam, start Steam VR, start Oculus. You know, it's a it's a process, and it's completely separated from all the other stuff that I do. So I think what's going to happen is when we talk about like Gen Z, and actually there's a term coming out now, Gen Alpha, the ones coming after Gen Z, the people who, when they grow up, games is like having five fingers, ten fingers, I guess. Playing <laughs> games is like having a, a typical limb. It's People don't think of themselves as gamers anymore. They're just people with devices who happen to play games occasionally. And when those kids grow up, they're not just going to grow up in a tablet first world or a mobile first world, which is powering the Gen Z generation that we have today. But really, they're going to be growing up in a spatial device powered world. And I think those people will be growing into a world that is very mainstream when it comes to VR and AR. Very, very interesting. I think one important sort of differentiation to make is like, what is the difference between virtual reality and augmented reality? What are they? And sort of like, are they going to be a part of the exact same ecosystem? Or are they two different things to build out? I think sometimes people just say VR, AR, and they don't really understand the difference. Sure. I mean, augmented reality enhances the reality around you. 
So you, you see what you see, but you add layer things on top, virtual reality, you replace the things around you with a completely new reality, right? So you are, uh, and a VR game is like, you know, I'm, I'm in a dungeon fighting zombies, you know, AR, I might see be in the studio, but maybe there's like a tower defense game that happens on top of the table in front of me and I can move things around. Um, very different, I think very different use cases, very different audiences, also diff somewhat different devices. The, the, the new devices are now both, where for example, you have the new MetaQuest Pro where you can have what's called pass-through. So you can see what's beyond the, the screens in color and you can start having AR with it. But I think ultimately the, the biggest AR device is actually our smartphone, you know, so for example, Instagram filters, Snapchat filters, and so forth. And so currently this is the format of AR, VR is the big goggles. And most of the goggles haven't been in the headsets, haven't been able to do AR until these new pro models. All right. So I'm going to speculate now. Cause you, you, you gave me an opening here. Okay, Felix. Let's you're talking about You're talking about this being the number one AR device, which is actually very, very accurate. And people, when they think of AR, they don't think of this, right? They don't. They think of glasses. So my speculation is... Nowadays, I use AR on this all the time. Dude, I can be in Japan with my with my Google Translator translating in real time. But it's annoying because I have to like, you know, scan things, right? Apple. This is my speculation, okay? This is the theory, okay? Call me crazy or call me genius. I believe, and I feel this way, right? Because I'm a VR developer. I have a lot of friends that are VR developers. I consider myself one of the top studios. I'm friends with other people that also have top studios, right? Um, Apple's not talked to any of us. And we're all confused. So I spoke to one engineer from Apple that focuses on AR. And he told me this, and it makes a lot of sense. He goes, Jonathan, what's Facebook's biggest issue? Not enough VR users, right? I'm like, yeah, you're right. He goes, if there's not enough VR users, how do you go to a VR developer, right? Or even a game developer? Like you have, you know, X millions of target marketable people on PC and console Go spend hundreds of millions of dollars and target 20 million headsets, right? Compared to two, 300 million consoles and infinite amount of PCs that you can't even count. It doesn't work. But what Apple's doing, and this is all speculation, don't take my word for it, is they already have, I think it's over 15,000, if I'm not mistaken, AR apps. Some of the most popular apps are, specifically one I'm thinking about is Niantic. Uh, they made Pokemon Go. It's huge. If they, if they come out with XR glasses right or apple headset right they don't even have to focus on vr at all because they already have 15,000 ar apps that can now be enhanced with the xr glasses and then they can go to vr developers and say hey we have x millions of users on ar we already have the hardware for it you can come and make a vr app put it on the headset and boom you're, you're targeting a massive a massively larger market so I genuinely think that AR is going to be a feeder into VR. And if you go to, you know, mm. an older person, it's going to be very hard to get them to VR. But if you just give them glasses that enhances their world, for example, how many people drive and have to look down at their phone for GPS? So I genuinely think that AR is going to be much bigger than VR in the short term. It just makes sense. We already have the apps for it. We have the needs for it. Um, and then all of this will lead into VR. And I genuinely think the future, and you know, MetaQuest Pro is already doing it with the past year. The, the future is going to be AR and VR combined, where AR is just enhancing everyday things. And at any moment, you can click a button and then boom, you're in the VR world, whether it's for gaming or for meditation or for meetings. And I genuinely see this, this, this convergence of AR and VR, but AR will kind of lead the path. One quick thing I would add to is that the the form factor and life integration need to get to a point where we carry around a headset with us essentially 24 seven, because the problem right now is that it's like this auxiliary device that sits at home. And because it's sitting somewhere in the corner, you, the average customer consumer doesn't think about it. Right. But if it's always on your desk, it's always in your pocket, it's always in your back, you always have it with you and you use it for various different things, whether it's reading a menu, whether it is a, a workout, whether it is a meditation. Now, all of a sudden, it's like always with us, always being used, which makes the stickiness and return factor so much higher than if you have to consciously think, I want to play game X now. Let me go to my living room. Oh, no, it's not charged. Now I got to recharge it, right? Like there's just removing that friction.
I, I love that take. A lot of people have sort of been wondering like, when is Apple gonna drop their headset? Everyone's seen that like fake headset rendering. What you're saying, both of you makes a lot of sense that they would go AR first. It seems like the AR technology, even though the content's already there, the, the glasses would be a little more difficult to, to build out. Do you guys agree with that? AR is just a really hard physics problem. I think what mm -hmm. people don't think about is true AR that isn't passed through where AR is being generated by taking the camera feed, which lets you see the world, and then you can render anything onto the camera feed. That's how the MetaQuest Pro does have sitting over here. Real AR, ergo, I'm wearing a pair of smart glasses, and they just give me some contextual information, like uh, my phone and my glasses, essentially, is a really hard problem because you have to somehow beat the sun. And what I mean by that is you're going to be wearing these outside. Um, but what happens is you go outside and now the sun is shining onto these lenses, which means that anything you render onto these lenses or beam into your eye has to outcompete the light of the sun. Hmm. That makes it really freaking hard, but you can't really use them outside. And that's actually still true with the pass-through mixed reality experiences. The cameras stop tracking very well when the sunlight hits them. Um, so we don't get away from that problem entirely, but that's going to be the big um blocker for AR for the foreseeable future until someone figures out a better way to drive light into your eyes using waveguides or similar. And there's a bunch of research on this. Like this isn't something that they're just realizing now. People have been R&Ding on this for a decade. Um, but it's probably going to take a couple more years before we have, I think, this dream. Um, mm. You know, Zuckerberg had the Ray-Ban glasses that they did in, in, uh, with Luxottica, uh, which are like zero, version 0 0.5 or 0 0.1, if you will. Um, but even those are really just glasses with a camera that you can record with. I think it's it's worthwhile to take a moment to just like talk about Meta. And I'm curious how you guys feel. They did a big rebrand last year. They've spent 36, put $36 billion of resources towards their sort of metaverse future. Um, they are set to spend as much as the Apollo space program on their VR reality labs. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg got a lot of shit for this decision. How do you view his decision? Look, I, th I think, first of all, the move of, for Meta to go into, into VR at that scale was probably one of the best things to happen for VR uh, over a long period of time, not short period of time. Um, does, does Facebook, now Meta, have a branding problem? Yes, it did. Um, I think that's becoming slightly better. People hate Suck and Meta less when they're not... Well, now that they're slowly becoming more of an underdog because their, their stock has dropped so much, you know, Suck has been going on podcasts, so he's becoming more humanized. And I think also they realize they've learned from some of their hoopers, right? Where initially they said, we will, we're going to own the metaverse, we're going to do everything ourselves. Now they're becoming more of an ecosystem player, um, which is also something positive. As it stands right now, they do have, I would say, a lot like clear, not even question dominance in the segment, uh, whether that is with headset owners, whether that's with content traction and so forth. Um, there is not like there are some number twos, but they, they, they don't compete yet, whether it's a Pico, a PlayStation, VR1 and so forth. Now that can change because you've got a lot more competitors coming out and how they handle it, whether that's PlayStation VR2 or Apple, we'll see. Um, I think net, 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 net positive, a lot of cash investments. And also I think the direction change that's happening now is also important um, that they're going to switch maybe from doing purely horizons towards um, supporting the best players in the ecosystem. Um, it also is a no brainer because if you really think about what Facebook's mission was, you know, on the surface to connect people, is to connect people. Right. And then nowadays there's so much, it's an attention economy, right? There's TikTok, there's Twitter, there's Vine, there's Snapchat, there's Instagram. So I think he is very smart because he saw an opportunity in virtual reality with the Oculus acquisition and very little competition. So he has what he acquired them in 2014. Um, he has, you know, an eight, nine year lead on, on major corporations. Um, yeah. Killing it. Okay. So we're a 24 person company and we've had to turn our ship's direction in the past. And as an operator, that's actually quite hard to do and takes a lot of time, takes a lot of willpower, not on the individual, but as an organization to kind of get through a period of uncertainty. And so I have to say, I'm very impressed by Mark. I think what he's done takes a lot of guts and he is very much betting. He's not betting all. There's a lot of misconceptions about Meta that I'm going to 
shatter here because they shattered mine just two weeks ago. And it kind of opened my mind a little bit to how to think about this from a meta perspective. Here's some interesting stats for you. Uh, Facebook is still growing roughly 3% year on year. I used to think for up until two weeks ago that Facebook was declining and users revenue on Facebook is still going up. Facebook or Meta rather also owns WhatsApp. WhatsApp is pretty much completely unmonetized outside of a couple of regions. Once they figure out how to monetize WhatsApp, if they figure out how to monetize WhatsApp, there is yet another behemoth of a revenue generator for them, whether it's on the ad business or business API uh, model. And then, you know, if you, if you assume that nothing of this happens, which is that Facebook stops growing and that they don't figure out how to monetize WhatsApp, they're still profitable in the billions every year. So <laughs> what we're talking about here isn't Zuckerberg betting the whole cow. It's Zuckerberg saying we're a company that is about connecting people. And here is a telepresence platform that's going to make connecting with people infinitely better. So we have to be top front and center there. But I don't think that's the same thing as I'm taking all of my IP and everything we've ever done and putting it onto the cash cow column and hoping it will generate as much money as possible while we become the best in VR. He's also said that like they they predict they'll probably lose money or maybe break even on like hardware sales and that they really envision like the long term play as basically like a SaaS play. Like, do you think that that model makes sense for them? I'm going to start on this one. Um, I, I, it used to be like this. We would look forward to Christmas and we would go buy our games for $60 roughly per game. And then this game I got to play forever until I grew tired of it. And if it was some of the games that I played as a kid, I would play them for months or even years. That means that I got hundreds of hours, sometimes thousands of hours of entertainment for $60. And I think the reality is that if I was paying per unit of entertainment, I should be paying way more if I was to normalize it against other things I could mm -hmm. spend my money for entertainment on. The reality, I think, is the way we use these applications warrants us to pay more for them to get that entertainment value. I think it's just natural. I think it, it was always have to be this way because games got more expensive to make, more people started playing them, and the models evolved. Totally. For the VC community, I think there's a, a feeling that, you know, five years ago, a lot of people tried to put money in VR. A lot of those companies didn't work out. They kind of got impatient and they backed away from it for a while. I do feel that there's this feeling people are really looking at the space again and wanting to get involved. Where do you begin? What's your advice you could offer them? I would say step one, uh, lay down old assumptions. Uh, I've come across a lot of VCs. They might've tried VR in 2015, 16, 17, 18. They formed an opinion, they formed a thesis, and they've stuck with that thesis. Um, and VR is a very fast evolving space. And so I find that a lot of generalist VCs step away from VR investments because they've already made up their mind. And so I think it's good to revisit the facts, revisit the numbers, but also revisit the medium. Try it out, like buy one of the new headsets, try things out. Um, that's, that's one angle. Um, second angle I would say is, Ironically, you know, VR metaverse, those two worlds, because they're, they're virtually the same, but they're so different, where VR is the underdog, metaverse is the hype, where last cycle, meaning last year or even beginning of last year, you had a number of metaverse companies, like more than Web3 angle, get funded by people that only looked at a single player, a single actor, right? So they bought, but they bought into, let's say, an open world at a 200 million valuation when there's 100 of them. Right. So also get your comps because the reality is, is that um, there's no shortage of open worlds. And a lot of the economics of those are really questionable. And last but not least, I would say it's a very small and tight knit community. And so the best way to find the best investments to probably, you know, get to know the people like I'm, I'm always shocked how many of my portfolio founders know each other. You know, I know a lot of founders that actually their original dream was to build a VR company and it was too hard basically. So they pivoted to FinTech or SaaS or something like that. Um, as it becomes, you know, something that's more of a possible reality for people to uh, sort of thrive in, what is your advice for founders that want to build in the space today? I, I think that virtual reality became financially feasible, at least on paper for traditional venture capitalists. I'd say about 
maximum a year ago. I think before that, it was just completely financially unfeasible. There, there came a few hype waves that never actually you know, came to fruition. Um, and at the time, you could only really raise capital if you had a successful exit or some crazy track record because it was very speculative. But now the numbers don't lie, right? There, there's almost 20 million Quest 2s in the market. That's a huge ecosystem. Um, and there's a lot of applications. There's only 400 apps on the App Store. On, on, on Oculus. It's, I mean, there is, there's such a lack of content and, you know, companies like Meta are even giving grants out to developers to, to help make more content. So I think there's never been a better time than now. And all you really have to do is spend hundreds of hours in virtual reality, really understand where we're at today. And if you're a normal gamer or just a normal person, you're, you're going to see holes missing everywhere. I mean, you know, take a look at Tinder. Tinder and VR, right? Like, I, I, I hate to say that, but, right, Call of Duty, where's Call of Duty in VR? Where's Snapchat in VR, right? Like, all these major applications that already have traction and are, you know, proven in 2D flat screen worlds, um, you know, you can take almost the same principles and just apply it to something that has better presence and connection. It's all about user experience and interacting in VR, and this has not been standardized yet. There is no you know, proper, there's no standard way of how to hold something, how to grab something, how to send messages in VR, how to send videos in VR, right? Like none of this is standardized. So really being a VR consumer is, is probably more valuable than anything else, right? Like having 10 years of experience in TV does not matter for VR. Like you need to understand how this works. Mm -hmm.